Whether you operate one forklift or thousands, one location or hundreds, the new My Toyota customer portal can help you optimize your operation and material handling equipment. This one-stop, free-to-use platform is designed to help you take control of your information and make smarter decisions, all at the touch of a button. Register and access your data today at my.toyotaforklift.com. That's my.toyotaforklift.com. The New Warehouse Podcast, hosted by Kevin Lawton, is your source for insights and ideas from the distribution, transportation, and logistics industry. A new episode every Monday morning brings you the latest from industry experts and thought leaders. And now, here's Kevin. Welcome to the New Warehouse Podcast. This is episode five. Um, I have a very special guest today. Uh, it is actually my mother. Uh, her, name, her name is Claudia Monte, and uh, she's been consulting um, through CAM Consulting Group for a long time since I was very little so a long time now uh, I'll have her say how long actually and so she's going to come on she does a lot of HR um, involved projects um, and consulting um, but she also does a lot of training and management training um, so she's going to talk to us a little bit about that training and what's involved in talking about uh, leadership especially when it comes to leading in uh, the distribution environment um, so mom Claudia Welcome to the show. Um, thanks for coming on. Uh, I came all the way up uh, from Florida to be here just on the show, just for the show, right? Or no, to see me. No, not even to see me anymore. I think just to see my son. Um, so welcome to the show. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit, I guess, um, about yourself and about CAM Consulting Group and all of that kind of stuff. Well, thanks, Kevin. It's really a privilege, you know, to be here you know, especially at the launch of your new warehouse, your site that you have, and this new venture for you. Um, so today, as I as I say, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you both as a mom, but I'm also proud of you as a business person, you know, as to what it is that you're trying to achieve. Uh, for, as Kevin said, for quite a while, actually last year was the 25th anniversary of the firm, uh, of CAM Consulting Group, or CAM Consulting Group, however you wish to refer to it, where... We have had the privilege, and I consider it very much a privilege, you know, of working with clients across the country and helping them and the people in their organizations become successful in the various roles that they have. Now, our client base is incredibly diverse, you know, across all the sectors, public sector, private sector, legal, library, nonprofit, you name it, I think we've been able to be invited and I look at it as an invitation, you know, to go into these various settings. What it has done, and that's what I hope to share with you a bit today, is that it's allowed us to really see best practices that are out there. You know, that we always try to bring into our classes when we teach. We try to bring it into our consulting mind, where we see things that have worked and worked very well. But in all honesty, we also see an awful lot of worst practices that are out there. You know, and I consider both of them to be learning opportunities about how do you really tap into the talents of people. You know, because no matter what you do, it always comes down to people that you take through a process to achieve an objective. And people are the most valuable resource in any organization. And that, you might say, is the starting point for everything. And that's what drives, you know, the HR spectrum, the consulting side that we do, where we work with companies on the life cycle of an employee, you know, from when they're onboarded, mm -hmm. you know, until at some point they move on, exit, right? And all of the performance matters that are in between. And and especially on the learning and development side, you know, where we have worked with everybody at every level of an organization, you know, from entry level all the way up to the uh, executive level, you know, in refining communication skills, teamwork skills, leadership skills, 
know, and that whole element of professionalism that's going to allow them to be successful in carrying out the process-oriented elements of their jobs, or you might say the technical expertise of their job. No matter what somebody needs to do, it's always a marriage between your interpersonal skills and your technical skills that are going to allow you to be successful. Definitely. So it sounds like kind of your central theme of uh, HR and training and consulting is really based around the people um, in general and kind of developing them and um, seeing, getting a company to see that it's worth investing in them. Absolutely. People keep coming back to the statement that people are your most valuable resource. You know, mm-hmm. An organization is just, quite frankly, an empty building unless the people are in it. Mm-hmm. When you focus on just logistics as a process, or if we take that, considering that's the focus of your entity here, you know, we've worked with quite a few of them. And you might say they have a soft spot for me because I actually started my career you know, in distribution and fulfillment. Right out of college, you know, I was hired to work for Johnson & Johnson in North Brunswick in the distribution center. Yeah. And just the actual movement of goods, somewhat incredible to watch. Because the foundation of everything, if you can't receive your goods or your products, can't inventory them or find them afterwards to pick them and you can't ship them Mm -hmm. do you really have a business because now you're not fulfilling some needs well that might be your process or the actual logistic movement of distribution but the reality of it is it's people that are making that happen they are the ones who are receiving it they are the ones that are based upon their commitment and their expectations are putting them away accurately to make it easier for the next person. So in the whole flow, everybody has a very critical role in order to get something out the door. Mm -hmm. Guiding that process is your management team. And that's really a very critical team because they drive and set, you know, what the performance expectations are. They open up the communications. They set the tone for everything that's going to happen, you know, that day. Mm -hmm. So the relationship with people, yeah, is a very critical one. Through the years, and and I remember when I first decided to focus on learning and development and training, and I heard once where a lot of, or not once, actually I heard it many times where people would say, oh, interpersonal skills or communication skills or what are considered under the umbrella of soft skills. Well, I'm going to tell you, I think they are hard skills. Because we can teach people easier how to move a product from point A to point B. What's really harder to teach is how to be courteous to your customers, how to be respectful Mm. to your colleagues. How to go that extra step. How do you go that extra step? How do you add value? You know, how do you communicate professionally through every level of an organization so that you can be heard? It consequently affects some outcomes. So when I look at back at the thousands, and it's been thousands of people that I have met over the years, those who have really been very successful are ones who are good, good leaders, good communicators, and very strong in their interpersonal dealings with others. Mm -hmm. And more than anything, they're open to listening. Who better to get some information from than the people who are actually doing the jobs? They live with it eight, ten hours a day. And they have very valuable insight that's going to say what works and what doesn't work if we're willing to listen to it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's um, really important. I mean, I've seen that in my experience as well, you know, uh, especially in a distribution environment. A lot of people, mm, I guess at the corporate level, in the office, um, they tend to think that the people at the distribution level are kind of, uh, uh, they're just like grunt workers kind of, um, you know, replaceable, I guess, in a sense, which uh, I think is the wrong way to think about things because, like you said, the people are kind of the lifeblood of the organization. The organization doesn't happen without the people. Mm -hmm. And when you look at a distribution center, uh, really your people that are in the distribution center are like your last line of defense to your customer because they're the last ones that's going to touch that product 
before it gets to your customer. Mm -hmm. So really they're in control of somewhat of your success because they're in control of whether the customer is going to get what they need to get uh, at the time they need to get it and whether they're going to get it correct. Um, so it is really important, I think. And, you know, I've been told myself, like I said, the soft uh, skill, I've been told that I have the ability to manage with the unique uh, soft touch, I believe is what this person told me before. Um, and I think that is something that's somewhat lost sometimes mm -hmm. um, because I think that, you know, in the distribution environment too, I think because of that mindset of, you know, these are just grunt workers, you know, it's almost like you have to kind of uh, drive them in a sense, but drive them in a difficult way where you don't actually get to know them and you don't necessarily value uh, what they're bringing to the organization. And I think that, but I think a lot of that is changing now um, because they're seeing the importance of, especially as we get into more automation and um, more technology, you need to understand the process a little more. Mm -hmm. And like you said, the person that's doing the process all day long for 300 whatever days a year, uh, they're the ones that really know the process and they know what's not working with the process. And if you give them, if you empower them to mm -hmm. speak up and say what they don't like about the process, then you could actually increase your efficiency um, and make the organization and process flow even better. Um, but like you said, you know, with leadership, um, it's a big part of how they lead. Um, and we actually had, on the last episode of the podcast, uh, we had uh, Dean Dorcas on, who's from a company called Easy Metrics. And he, actually how we started talking and got into the podcast episode is, you know, he had posted something on LinkedIn about people just being thrown into leadership positions and kind of without ever being developed or trained how to be an effective leader. Um, so I'm curious, you know, what do you think is kind of lacking in today's work environment uh, that's preventing, I guess, the proper development of effective leaders? One of the biggest challenges and difficulties that's, that I have seen is exactly what you just said, Kim. People are thrown into a supervisory role. Because you're a good accountant, will make you the head of the department. Yeah. Uh, because you're a good picker, or it will make you supervisor of inventory. Yeah. Well, those are two totally different skill sets, mm -hmm. and and it just does not work effectively because we're now putting you into a role where you're not going to be set up to succeed, and. People need to be set up to succeed, not set up to fail. So there has to be an element of training that before somebody gets put in that position, right, that's designed to allow them to be successful with that skill set. Dealing with people is, quite frankly, its own animal. Yeah. And in, in, in that, A, you better like people because you're going to spend more time dealing with personnel matters, concerns, issues than you are ever being that accountant, engineer, receiver than you ever did before. Yeah. So as you transition, it's always that blend of bringing the expertise that you might have, but now learning how to share that, how to teach it, how to set expectations, you know, how to give feedback, how to communicate in such a way that you build a powerful team. As a leader, you don't really need to know everything. You do need to know the exceptions to the norm. Mm -hmm. You build a strong team, well then now you have people you can rely upon and what a gift you have. Yeah. But you have to be willing to work with them. It's a two-way street. And what I see is if we don't lay some good foundation or some groundwork for some basic management 101 techniques, there are so many mistakes that are made you know, as somebody steps into that role, that the wall already comes up. Mm -hmm. And then it's very hard to go back and say, oh, I finally went to a class. Oh, I finally learned I should be setting some goals. Oh, I finally learned, yeah. you know, I should be clarifying expectations. Oh, I finally learned I should probably give some feedback and let them know how they're doing. Mm -hmm. By then, a lot of times the damage is done, and then it takes a while to build up the trust of the team again. So... Anytime somebody moves into another position, 
there should be that level of training that goes along with it. You know, there is, you know, today what I really see and more so happening, the world's moving really fast. And we're at a very interesting time in our business lives where we actually have five different generations in the workforce. You have a whole level of individuals who are moving on, right? And you have a very diverse, you know, very diverse background individuals across generations that are coming into the workforce. What is being done, and I put this out there very generally because it's a question I'm asking of my clients now, what is being done to develop your bench? Yeah. Your bench are the ones who are going to step into those leadership roles. You don't want to wake up one day and find a hole in your team and say, because there isn't anybody else, you now become the supervisor and they don't have a clue what to do with that. Yeah, yeah it's very be much some... like, oh, we have this open spot and uh, mm-hmm. we need to throw somebody in there. So uh, this is the best person on that team, mm-hmm. so uh, they get the spot. And they get the spot. And that's not necessarily fair to that person, and it certainly isn't fair right, to the individuals whose efforts they're going to be directing. So it should be a process of continuous learning so that as you look strategically, you, know, you look at all your players that you have, and that's all part of performance management. You know, where are their strengths? Who can be developed? Mm-hmm. You know, you make the analogy to any sports team. Yeah. You know, they step in and step out you know, on a continual basis, but they're prepared. Business, I wish, would put that same headset on, you know, of preparing people, you know, for various roles, you know, in the organization. And as they do that, look to see where, where their talent really is. You know, one of the things that you said is, as you were talking there for a moment, and you might say it's one element that I've always taken issue with, where people will say, and I think you said, you know, I'm just a grunt worker. Or somebody will say, you know, I'm just a secretary or I'm just a clerk. Mm-hmm. Nobody's just uh, anything. You're hired into an organization because you bring value and there's a role mm-hmm. for you. So you're a contributing member at every single level. Look at walking into a building. Take a warehouse. You walk into a warehouse distribution center and it's dirty, and it's just disorganized, and it's dark, lights are missing, what's the first impression that you make? Yeah, you don't, you don't care about the people that are in the building. You don't care about the people that are in the building, mm-hmm. right? And you also, do you really want to work in that building, if that's the first impression that you're making as you walk in a door? Mm-hmm. So take that analogy and then bring it back to, Who's probably one of the most important people in any organization, any entity? It's your maintenance workers. Yeah. Because they create first impressions of anybody, whether it's an employee or whether it's a customer, right? That's going to drive whether or not you want to stay there, whether you want to eat there, whether you want to work there, whether you want to live there. And yet, organizationally, how far down are they on the organization chart? To me, they should be at the top because they drive everything else. Yeah. So as you look at the various components of business, you begin to really see those that drive that impression and set the tone. Leaders set the organizational tone. They set the big tone. But there are so many other elements that contribute to that bigger picture that begin to affect outcomes, whether it's outcomes of talent acquisition, you know, those who want to come in, and today, I'm telling you, it's hard to get good people. Yeah. And if you get good people, right, then you want them to stay. There's your talent retention. Mm-hmm. You get good. You get good people in. You want to onboard them. You want to engage them. You want to give them opportunities to learn so that they stay. It's a cycle. You can't do one thing in a vacuum without it affecting something else. As you look at the big picture of the dynamics of people and their contribution. You know, to to a warehouse, to an entity, to a government sector, whatever the circumstance might be. We'll be back after a quick break. You hear a lot about supply chains these days, because if the past couple years have taught us anything, it's that an efficient, well-managed supply chain is absolutely critical to keeping businesses successful and consumers happy. I'm Will Haywood, and I host a podcast called All Business, No Boundaries, where we talk about supply chains, how they work, what happens when they don't, 
and the innovations that are redefining what's possible in the world of logistics. Join me for insightful interviews with thought leaders and industry experts. We discuss how optimizing supply chains can break down the barriers that are holding businesses back. That's All Business, No Boundaries by DHL Supply Chain. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think definitely, especially in our industry, like the logistics distribution industries, there's so many... Mm, there's so many distribution centers that are out there in concentrated areas that, you know, if you're not doing something different to retain your employees, Mm -hmm. then your employees just might not care because they know that down the road, somebody already has a sign out that says they're now hiring forklift drivers at $15 an hour or something. Mm -hmm. So they know they're going to get another job and they know like Amazon will hire anybody off the street. You just have mm-hmm. to say hello to them and they'll hire you. So there's always kind of another opportunity. So I think, you know, especially when you said, you know, you walk into a building and lights aren't working, it's dirty, um, maybe it's unsafe potentially as well. Um, I think you're, you know, you're making kind of a statement there without saying anything um, about what you think about that part of your organization. Mm-hmm. And you're not giving it the focus when you probably should be. And I think too, you know, from my standpoint as uh, you know warehouse manager I think that if if someone said to you that you're gonna have like a customer or somebody from another company uh, come and do a tour of your warehouse tomorrow and if you're panicking because you're embarrassed of what they're gonna see then I think that you need to change your thinking and your priority and um, you know you shouldn't be panicked. You should be wanting to invite people in to come see your building because you should be you should be proud of it. Should be proud of it. And the people there should be proud of where they're working as well because of the way it looks. I mean, I've worked in I worked in buildings like you said where mm-hmm. you know the lights weren't working, it was old, dingy, dust was you know an inch thick mm-hmm. on the product. Um, and then you know I've worked in buildings where you know they're spotless and you know cleaning the floor scrubbing the floors every day and you know shiny you can see themselves in and the morale based on that um is much different and you know i've had people come into that cleaner building um from other warehouses and like uh, employees um like floor level employees and they say like right off the bat they said wow i can't believe how clean it is it's so nice um and you know those people may have worked in multiple distribution centers um, through their career. And so for them to say that is a good thing and, you know, it makes them feel more comfortable. I think it gives them a better impression of the company overall, like you said. Mm -hmm. People want to work in a safe, clean environment. They want some pride of ownership. And that's really important. I read something recently that has stayed with me on the onboarding process. And here you're in a competitive market to get good workers. And in that hiring process, you know, it still amazes me that people can show up for the first day of work and nobody knows that they're coming. Mm -hmm. There's no place set up for them. They don't know how to get in. Nobody introduces them. Where do they go for lunch? How do they get in? None of that is done. Well, that doesn't really set a tone and do I even want to go back on day two? I will probably do it because I need the paycheck, you know, which is fundamental to everything. Paychecks don't make a stay though. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the other elements, and we can go back to the grandfather of motivational theory, Maslow, you know, that there is a hierarchy of motivation that keeps us there long term. And above that is safety and security. So when we walk in and we see a place that is environmentally welcoming to us and environmentally conscious, you know, for us to be in a safe place, well, then we don't mind going there every day. Well, even higher than that, and here's where pride of ownership tends to come in. I love when I go in and I'm in and out of places all the time, so I make first impressions very quickly. Mm -hmm. I can't even begin to tell you how many distribution centers I've been in. It's numerous. Those who are really pride, they can't wait to give you a tour, tell you what's on their line, show you the products, show you the systems. They get so involved, and they are the ones who technically don't even have the management titles. 
Yeah. But they're just proud of, of what they do. Well, that's a key element of engagement. And engagement begins as soon as somebody's onboarded into a company. Now, onboarding is very different than orientation. Orientation, this is how you get your paycheck, tell me how you do a direct deposit, these are your medical benefits, that's your orientation. Mm -hmm. Onboarding actually starts from day one with the way somebody is welcomed into the team or welcomed into the environment, what's set up for them. Who are they reporting to? They get to meet their supervisor, they get to meet others, they get introduced. Right on day one, right, they're told what the job is, what's expected of the job, they're shown the tools, their lockers, what they're going to use, the tools of the trade, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And they are assigned somebody as a mentor who can help them on the line, or elsewhere in the warehouse, and the supervisor touches base with them on a regular basis. Those who are engaged right from the very beginning. And the, first, and the onboarding is a six month to a year process. It's not, hi, this is your first day and I never talk to you again. Mm -hmm. Those who are have a good, strong start, studies will tell you the more engaged they are, the longer they're going to stay, yeah. the more you're going to get loyalty from them. So when they go and hang out a sign across the street, you know, for warehouse workers, it isn't going to necessarily be the money that's going to take them over there. Yeah. Right, they're already in the hierarchy of motivation. Yes, they have a fair, and you have to pay fairly, right, in a competitive market. They have, they're in a safe, environmentally clean, you know, building, right. But it also has to deal, you know, with with recognition. It also has to deal with their social. They're welcome. They're a part of the team. They feel they contribute some value. Their ego. They get feedback. They know where they stand. And they see opportunity. And at the very top of the hierarchy, is, it's called self-fulfillment or self-actualization, which is personal to everybody. And But as you get to know people, especially when you think about performance management with, between supervisors and an employee, I just use those terms generically, performance management is really getting to know them and having these conversations. Because you're there as a supervisor to advocate for that individual, to direct their efforts, and to give them every opportunity that they choose to accept, you know, in, in a company. But if you don't do all of that, you know, we don't really tap into those talents. So if I really feel somebody doesn't care, or a company doesn't care, you hear that term disengaged, you have a world of disengaged employees out there. I'll show up every day because I need to get paid. Don't ask me to do more. Don't ask me to think. I won't do any less. I'll do what I have to do. do I will coast yeah. and I will get out the door. Yeah. Is that the type of organization you really want to have? Right? When quite frankly, you probably have incredible intelligence walking around your building. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you tap into that? And that's where you give them the opportunities for learning and development. Now, there are... I'm very much, you know, a, a believer and actually specialized in the field of emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence, you might say, is, you know, as compared to, it's also known as EIEQ, you know, as compared to your intelligent quotient known as your IQ. IQ is, a, in a very simplistic form, is what you do or what you're capable of doing. Mm -hmm. Your EI, EQ, your emotional intelligence, you might say, is how you do it. Yeah. You need that marriage of all of that in addition to the third element that makes us a whole person or our personalities. There are some people who are quiet. There are some people who love to talk. There are some people you know, who are jolly. There are some people that are just complainers all the time. <laughs> but And they're everywhere. They are everywhere. Yes. But And they are incredible energy drains. But that could be another whole topic in and of itself. But the reality of it is, is that we all have the ability to be, we're all leaders in whatever role we're in. It's whether or not we accept that role. Business-wise, you know, by title, we have formal leadership titles, whether it's director, manager, supervisor, you know, at which point we have organizational responsibility for those who report to us. Depending on how you're set up, you might have direct reports, responsible for their performance and behavior on the job. In a lot of entities, you also have indirect dotting responsibilities and reporting. Mm -hmm. So that even though you may be in supervisor of receiving, 
right? You're going to have a relationship with quality control, quality assurance, etc. Yeah. Because all these elements are interconnected, you know, throughout throughout the company. You can't do one without the other. How you build these relationships internally is really key to being able to deliver your external service, to deliver your product to your external customers, and consequently the service that goes along with that. Mm-hmm. Internal always drives external outcomes. If you care about your customers and you're always preaching value added to the customers, your internal customers are your employees. Yeah. However you want to treat your external, it's the exact same thing that you should be doing for your internal. Because if they really care, guess what? That's the value that's going to be added to the external world. Yeah. And they're going to see that and feel that and begin to see the benefit of that. Everybody wins with that. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's kind of um, like the intrapreneurial mindset, too. Is, you know, mm-hmm. you're always, like, for me, I always think and, you know, I tell people that work for me that, you know, we're not just servicing the customers, but we're servicing the other departments that need something from us as well. Mm-hmm. So we need to treat them and work with them just like we work with the customer and collaboration is the key there. Yeah. It is. One of the, an exercise we've always done and I find people struggle about it is you know, define your internal customers and define your external customers. The list of external is always written first. Mm-hmm. List of internal is we do these in small groups, always goes back to, what do you really mean by that? Who would that be? Yeah. And people really need to step back. And as they do, it's like, oh, I didn't think about that. I guess we do need that in order to get something done. Now, maybe we have some better understanding. If we get an email saying, I need to have this report completed by, that they understand the importance of what the numbers that go into that report because it's probably just part of a, what you might call a domino chain that's going to work its way up and out to some sort of meeting, right, that's going to occur, you know, at a different level. But if you don't understand the whole scope of the business or what it's all about or what your role is in that business, then you have a hard, then you may hesitate and say, oh, what's the big deal related to this? may not be a big deal to you, but it's a big deal to somebody else. And that's collaboration. Yeah, yeah. But there's where communication tends to come into play, too. Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, you know, looking at the internal customer idea, you know, for distribution center, I mean, I think one of the biggest internal customers for the distribution side is typically customer service because customer service is communicating with the customer and they're always asking about their shipment or, you know, saying that, you know, maybe from an inventory perspective, they're saying that a customer was shorted a couple pieces and now that investigation goes on the distribution side because you need to see do I have extra pieces in the pick location because they were shorted or no, I don't have anything extra here and now it needs to go to transportation and they have to make a claim uh, with the carrier. Um, So, you know, servicing those internal customers, like you said, is just as important as servicing the external customers because then it leads all to giving the best experience to the external customer, the external which is really customer. where your business is coming from. Right? That's, good. That's correct. And that really comes down to the essence of communication. When communication works and works well, things flow smoothly. It's a lot more effective. It's efficient. When communication breaks down, everything else breaks down along with it. it Remember I said, we've said this several times, leaders really set the tone. Mm -hmm. Here we come back to the how. Here's your AI component. How you communicate, how clearly you communicate, how you define expectations goes a long way, right, to getting what it is that needs to be accomplished. If you don't approach people respectfully, and I'm not saying you agree or you're happy or any of that. I'm just talking about respect. Mm-hmm. Uh, earlier you said you had somebody had mentioned to you about you have a soft touch. Soft, I always say soft but firm. Soft is that relevancy to people you know, or that concern for people. But at the same time, you're still running a business. So there's that element of firmness that we need to get stuff done. Yes. Yeah. So how do we 
do that. Somebody makes a mistake if we use your example. Something gets shorted before, you know, when a customer calls and complains. Go back to the person online and say, what did you do? First thing you're going to get is a line of defense because that's the way we're wired. Yeah. And now you're not really accomplishing anything. You know, versus, you know, focusing on it from an issue perspective. You know, we had a situation occur with XYZ customer, you know, who somehow got shorted three cases of water or whatever the product might be. Mm -hmm. You know, what could have, what happened here? What do you think happened? Tell me. You know, let's go back through these steps. What can we do? And it isn't just short term, let's fix this. But long term, how do we avoid this happening in the future? How do you prevent it? Yeah. How do we prevent it? Yeah, business is very good at putting band-aids on things, and right? Because and firefighting and all those elements, put any term to that you want. But the reality of it is you're really trying to run an effective, efficient business that you know is also cost-wise. You know, there, there's always a bottom line that comes into that. So you need to go back and, and revisit and do an assessment with all the players that are involved. Mm -hmm. Say, how do we make this process work a little bit better? Years ago, in working with a lot of manufacturing and distribution entities, there was, in this, and I'm going to date myself with this one, but this was during the era where the introduction of what was called then total quality management. Okay. okay today, you might hear it referred to more as uh, the lean culture, you know, or operating in yeah. a lean way. They're all rooted in continuous improvement. I mean, that's they're all packaged a little bit differently, but it's on, on the theory of continuous improvement. You know, how do we operate um, more efficiently? How do we speed up the process but still keep integrity? How do we reach 100% quality of whatever goes out the door mm. while maintaining you know, the level of activity that we need to maintain? It's focusing on results, but it's a continual analysis you know, of the results and the people do we have the right people in place, you know, who can begin, who can make all of this happen? Yeah. So as you put on a headset of continuous improvement and you go back and analyze, it isn't about blame, it isn't about failure, it's not about what's wrong. It's about how do we correct it moving forward. And that's really a major element, you know, when it comes to dealing with people. You know, as a supervisor, your words are carry incredible power. Feedback can be destructive or it can be constructive. Constructive, mm -hmm. people learn from it. People who are very good at that or have a high level of EI or EQ, they can point out the biggest mistake you've probably ever met or you ever made and afterwards you say thank you. Mm -hmm. Those who deliver it in a negative way make you feel so small that you don't even hear the message. All you want to do is get out of the room. Yeah. So what have you accomplished in that latter example? Nothing. Because the odds are they still don't really understand what happened. All they know is I'm not doing that again, and I'm not going to do anything else. I'm not going to touch anything else. Yeah. See how when communication is really very strong, everything else comes around. You know, I may not agree with you, but I respect your point of view. Now let's see how we work together. If I, if you are open with me and transparent with me and give me some good guidance and some good feedback, well then I'm going to trust your vision too as a leader. Yeah. See how trust begins to, to build up. You know, all of these, to me, which are three critical elements, you know, of if, if I, re if, if I respect you, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to talk to you. Yeah. If I don't have those elements, you know, or if you don't talk to me, hmm, then I may not trust you. See how they all come around, you know, in a cycle all of the time. So that role, you know, of supervisor, whoever, they will always tell you, and I haven't seen a study to refute this yet, people derive their greatest level of job satisfaction from the relationship they have with their direct supervisor. If I... I'm treated respectfully and I come into work and I at least get a good morning or acknowledgement from you every day. Yeah. Well then the odds are, you know, I'm gonna stay. If all I ever do is get yelled at, well then I'm gonna stay until I can find something else. Yeah.
Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and I've heard that from you know friends and peers where they say, mm-hmm. oh, like I'm thinking for a new job, and I say, oh, like I thought that was a good company. And say, yeah, but you know, I can't can't stay at my boss or something like mm-hmm. that. And Always. And people lead people, I guess, right? It's kind yeah. of the saying, right? That's the saying. People take jobs for a lot of reasons, but I always say people stay mm-hmm. because of people. Yeah. They either have a good team and the opportunities with that, or in a good boss. But more often than not, people lead because of people. And that's a very sad commentary because I have watched the revolving door, Mm -hmm. at which point I've had to go back to that executive level and say, how many bodies are going to sacrifice because of the behavior of one? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the overall theme um, that you're talking about is really, you know, focusing on the people and learning and development and kind of um, catering to, not necessarily catering, but fulfilling people's needs, like giving people that little bit extra um, that they may be looking for, maybe not, um, maybe not that they know they're looking for, but subconsciously that kind of feeds them and gives them um, what they want and makes them feel like they belong and makes them feel like they are a part of the organization. Mm-hmm. And that's really how you up your employee retention, which I think as a leader, that's uh, that's one of your responsibilities is keeping people, right? So that they are graded on your, obviously your metrics, your numbers, mm-hmm. but then you're graded on how well do you uh, retain employees. Because like, mm-hmm. like you said, if you have a rotating door and you know, you're looking at um, this manager, director, and in the past year, they've lost four people and hired four more, and one of them didn't even last a year. Um, then I think you know you have to look and see what's the problem with that person, really. Yeah. Yeah. There is a wonderful model out there that we incorporate in all of our classes of leadership. It's called situational leadership. You know, it was designed by Hershey and Blanchard. And why I like it so much is because it makes you as a leader step back and adapt your style to the development level and the needs of your people. Mm -hmm. It isn't that the people meet you, right? You adapt your style to help them be successful. So what you can do with somebody who walks in the door initially, brand new, they don't know anything, your style is what's called the directing style. They want to be told what to do because they've never been in the building before. Yeah, they have no idea. They have no idea. Now, however, you know, on the higher end of the scale, you have somebody who's experienced, who's been doing the job, uh, who can basically operate, you know, pretty much on their own. And if you are still using that directing style with that individual who's at the top of their game, you're now guilty of being a micromanager. Mm -hmm. And the odds are you're going to lose that person because they feel that you don't trust their credibility and their skill set, you know, to basically do it. And then, of course, you have those individuals who are in the middle, you know, of which probably 80 percent of the workforce is in, where you use more of a coaching style because you are trying to tap, as I said before, tap into their talents. What do they have? What motivates them? Where would they like to go? What else would they like to learn about? Mm -hmm. And what can you offer them? We have, as I said, you know, today as we look at communicating across generations, we have a diverse workforce, work base, is that we have many individuals today who come in who have incredible insight, right? But let's say English is not necessarily their primary language. Mm -hmm. And so we can have people that have all different levels of skill sets and different degrees of all of that. There are opportunities out there to try to help people with their communication skills so that they can begin to grow not only as a professional, and I truly believe no matter what title somebody has, they're professionals in any business, Mm -hmm. but also help them grow personally too. Because as people get comfortable with their communication skills, their confidence level grows, their ability to relate people becomes better and consequently they become more visible you know in any company too and there is an opportunity there where is I'm a fan very much of of mentoring and where you have somebody that might be stronger in that skill set whether it's technical whether it's with language right that helps out somebody who's struggling in one of those areas 
may not directly report to them because most people, I'll tell you, don't want to go to their boss and say, I don't know how to, or I don't know how to say, or I don't know what. Even as adults, we don't want to acknowledge that we don't know, when in reality, we don't know a lot. But we will go to a peer, we'll go to a colleague a little bit easier and say, help me out with. As long as that, that peer or that colleague is willing to collaborate and help them. Take that person at the high end of the scale, you know, with their expertise. What a gift to motivate them to tap into their knowledge and transfer that knowledge to the new ones coming in. As a supervisor, that frees you up to get your job done. Yeah. And they have somebody else that they can just talk to who will probably help hold their hands a bit figuratively and with some people probably literally, all right, to get them through the day to show them where everything is. Yeah. But you're also showing your trust in them and their expertise that they've gained over the years to teach. And that's a very valuable motivator, mm-hmm. you know, for, on, for both parties and all those that are involved. Tap into, you have incredible strengths in an organization. I always say companies use them. But first you've got to know who they are and what they are, which means you've got to talk to your people. Yeah, got to get to know them, yeah. Got to get to know them. You know, three key things always in communication, you have to know your audience. Yeah. Whether it's a one-on-one conversation, whether it's a major presentation that you're making, you know, but at every level you have to know your audience because middle management probably has one of the toughest jobs that's out there because you're trying to lead from the middle. Yeah. You have individuals below you whose efforts you need to direct, you need to monitor, Right? You have those, you're getting directives from above, you know, from the corporate world and every level that's in between. Mm-hmm. And you are the, the point of contact with all the other departments, so there's the collaborative internal entity that you need to build good relationships to get something done and something out the door. Yeah, It's a tough job, but it's a very critical job because it's the one that keeps everybody and everything moving. I mean, you have to have good communication skills and interpersonal skills Definitely. to make that happen. Yeah. All right. So, sounds like people, communication, trust. Respect. And respect. Right. All right. So, you know, definitely great um, stuff from Claudia, a.k.a. my mom. Um, so, thanks so much for coming on the show. Um, we're actually going to have um, some blog posts contributed um, by Claudia as well. Sorry, it feels, it feels very weird saying Claudia because I've said mom my whole life. Um, so Claudia, should we actually be contributing some guest articles um, from an HR perspective on the newwarehouse.com as well? Um, so head to the newwarehouse.com and you can check out those as well and read them um, to kind of complement the podcast and also um, some different topics as they come up. I know myself um, working in the industry, um, you know, I have some HR questions as well that, you know, I reach out to her and ask her. Um, so we're actually going to be making those into a couple of posts um, that will be there for everybody to reference as well. Um, so, you know, if people want to get in touch with you, how could they do that? And what's your website? If you want to get in, in touch with me, website is www.camp4consulting.com. I will tell you it's in the process of being updated, but... If you have particular questions, you will. See, if you go there, you'll see my email address. You know, is right there. The phone mm-hmm. number is there. I'm more than happy. And if there are certain topics that you would like to see addressed in a blog, I'd love for you to either email through, go right to the contact on the new warehouse. Mm-hmm. Say, I would like to know how do I, how do I deal with that difficult employee? How do I get people to come to work one time? Uh, what do we do? What do you recommend for an onboarding process? Yeah. And that will give us good insight to see how we can actually meet your needs, you know, and have maybe at times in a, you know a blog that will answer your question, so it becomes very real and relevant for you. Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, and it's camforconsulting dot com. com, and that's number four. And that is number four. It's cam four number four consulting dot com. Mm-hmm. If you wish to email me, it's c monte at cam four consulting dot com. But if you go to the website, there should be a message that's going to direct you right to me. Um, so I thank Kevin 
you know, for the opportunity, all right, to be here as a resident HR expert, but also as a very proud mom of all that he has accomplished and all that I know that he still will. Mm, all right. Thanks, Mom. Uh, so we'll post all that information as well, uh, website, email, stuff like that on uh, thenewwarehouse.com. So if you want to reference it, uh, it will be there for you. So thanks for listening to this episode of the thenewwarehouse.com podcast. Talk to you next time. You've been listening to the New Warehouse Podcast with Kevin Lawton. Subscribe and check us out online at thenewwarehouse.com. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you want more content from The New Warehouse, check out our new video series called All Hands on LinkedIn. Just search for The New Warehouse on LinkedIn and follow along.